general, uh, we've seen one application in the previous talk, I'll mention at least one other. Uh, and then, uh, so I'm going to do that over here. And uh, Robert is going to tell you more about what we've actually done in Sage over here. Uh, we only coordinated this about 10 minutes ago. So it may happen that this, we, we, fought, we discover that there's some notation over here that needs to be defined over here, in which case I might pop back up and do that. Uh, we're trying to give a tag team motion for us. This will be exciting. OK, so the general setup, and we'll specialize this rather drastically uh, in, a, in a few moments. But the general situation, and this is not maybe the most general situation, but this is general enough for this discussion, is that let's say x over k is a smooth projective curve, or k is a finite extension of qp. So I'm going to go straight to the local situation here for the purposes of this explanation, uh, that I'm just going to be working over finite extensions of qp. Um, and uh, what Coleman's theory of integration does is it tells you how to, so Coleman's integration theory tells us how to compute things like, it gives meaning to expressions of the form integral from p to q of omega, where say p and q are in the set of say k or even k bar rational points, but let's for just to keep down the level of confusion, let's just say I'm taking k points. If you need larger points, you can make k bigger. Um, but so p and q are k rational points on the curve, and omega is, well, for instance, omega could be, well, let me just say it's a one form, and I'll be a little more specific in a moment. But somehow the point is that if you have a one form, on the curve, and it doesn't have poles at p and q, but it's a, it is in fact defined at p and q, you should be able to integrate from p to q in some sensible fashion. Uh, and the, kind of the key features. Okay, do, you, do you assume good reduction here? Or? Uh, yes, so with good reduction. That's, yeah. Sorry. I don't want to discuss non good reduction cases. Could, could assume you could, you could avoid it, but then it's not really common to do it. But yeah, you have to do yeah, you have to do a little bit more for that. But I just want to stick to, to what Coleman did uh, in the good reduction case. So so the key features you want to have are things like what additivity in, in, in the point, and you want additivity in the form. Well, I, mean, I should say linearity in the form. Uh, so omega is a, the omega is a form, and the lambdas are scalars, or, or constants, I should say. Um, and you want change your variable to behave properly. So if you have something like, again, I'm going to be a little bit imprecise for the moment. I'll be more precise in a moment you know, later. If you have something like a map from x to x prime, where this map doesn't really need to be defined everywhere. That's uh, what I get to. Uh, and you integrate the upper star of omega, where omega, maybe I should call it omega prime, and that's a form on x prime. That should be the same thing as integrating from phi of p to phi of q, just omega prime. on. So this is an integral on x, and this is an integral on x prime, and these should agree. And trivial remark, those lambda i should be on the outside of the integrals. Yeah. On the left. Oh yeah, because that's what makes this interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 what makes it actually linear. Uh, well, and the attitude. So you want these things to happen, and 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 I, maybe I won't actually give a, a precise theorem, but Coleman gives a recipe for for constructing a canonical uh, definition like this, where so Coleman makes this make sense. When omega is a hollow, is a let's say it's it's a it's a holomorphic one form, but it doesn't have to be holomorphic on the entire curve, and it doesn't even have to be mirror morphic. 
it, su it suffices for it to be a holomorphic one form on a wide open subset U of the corresponding rigid analytic space. Now, what does that mean? Uh, what it means is that here's the picture. You draw you draw x, or maybe you draw the, the rigid analytic space x n. Maybe I should make this have a high genus. Uh, so this thing splits up into residue disks, right? Because x, x I, I, I should have maybe drawn, maybe I should give a name to uh, the, the, the good reduction model. So this is spec k sitting inside spec OK. So uh, curly x will be the good reduction model. So this thing, of course, has a special fiber, uh, x, what do I want to call this, little k, curly. So curly, little, little curly k is the residue field. And the points of this rigid analytic space, uh, this sort of a map from the rigid analytic space to uh, the special fiber, and the preimages of individual points, because we're in the good reduction case, the preimages of individual points are just disks of radius, open disks of radius one. And uh, well, at least the preimages of the actual rational points, say, are good disks or open disks of radius one. Uh, <coughs> roughly speaking, that's the same. That's also true for the non-rational points. But uh, if, you, if you know what a disk is, uh, that's what a disk is. Uh, and the point is that a wide open subset should be something that you get by taking out certain closed disks in here. So you sort of strike out some, you, you strike out some finite number of closed disks, so a radius strictly less than one, and you have to keep everything else. So you sort of keep everything else. Now the picture's getting kind of crowded, but yeah, the mo the, maybe the more important thing is what I'm taking out. I'm taking out some closed, closed disks. Uh, but yes, they're, they're closed, so they have to have radius strictly less than one. So the subset covers all but finitely many of the residue disks, and on each other residue disk, it goes in a little bit. Uh, and that's, that's, what, uh, that's what I mean by wide open. And if you have anything defined on one of these, then uh, Coleman constructs an integral for it, as long as p and q uh, are actually in the subset where this thing's all over. So, um, and uh, we'll see, we won't, I won't give Coleman's definition, we'll sort of implicitly see it uh, in the calculation that we're going to do for hyperelliptic curves. So, any questions about the, the general picture? Or, yeah? So is it, is it non zero and unique up to a scalar? Uh, it is non-zero, yes, it is non-zero, it is unique up to, uh, well, I, I, I'm doing definite integrals here, so this is actually, uh, I've actually stamped out the ambiguity. If you did indefinite integrals, then yeah, there would be a global scalar that you have to carry around. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's, yes, and in particular, it's, it, it, it is not identically zero. But it's also normalized. Is this somehow normalized so that? Oh, I need some. Yeah, I need some normalization. Because um, two times the integral is. Yeah. What's the what normalization do I want here? Um, integral of gg. Hmm. Well, you want, Yeah, you didn't say what the integral of gg is. You'd like to say that. The no, I need the fundamental theorem of calculus. That would help. Yeah. So the integral of both of them. So the integral of an exact differential should just be uh, f of q minus f of p. And that should normalize it. Do I need do I need more normalization than that? Okay. Yeah. I'm probably just missing something stupid, but why as if the uh, disks you take away have to be closed, why does that mean they have to be really smaller than residue residue disks? Well the residue, well, the residue disk open. is an open disk of radius one. So a closed disk can oh, right have radius strictly less than one. Yeah, yeah. And so that leaves some annulus yep. still in. Yep. Yeah. It takes values in k. Uh, this yeah, because I'm working with k points, 
this should have values in k. I mean, I'm working with k points, and I'm working with forms defined over k, which are holomorphic on, on y over numbers. Thank you. I think it, it is safe to safe safe to also sort of state the other the other form of the theorem of conflicts. I don't know if you can manage with that, right? So if which one? Oh. Well, if you differentiate the integral of omega, you basically get omega. Right? Can you kind of follow some? I think it should follow. Definitely the oh, you want to say something like D of, uh, if I take, well, the thing is then I would have to actually introduce the indefinite integral, which is only locally analytic. But That's Yeah, maybe I should say, I mean, this is worth, this will come up later, so I should mention it. You can, you can integrate, you can do these integrals as local analytic, I mean, you can, you can form sort of an indefinite integral uh, as a lo you can form this as a locally analytic function because inside, in, in fact, inside each of these residue disks, uh, you can actually integrate this, uh, and then you can really just right, I mean, right. You take this, you uniformize this residue disk with some parameter, <laughs> and then you can just really write everything in terms of the parameter and just do the integral. And so, in particular, if you have two points in the same residue disk, you really can just do this integral formally and evaluate, plug in the two points, and get an answer. And of course, we will be doing that a little later. And so somehow, the, the content of Coleman's theorem is that there are these well-defined constants of integration that sort of between a point in one disk and a point in another disk. And somehow, that's where the content is, is that the, there's a sensible way to, to put constants of integration down to get, basically, the point will be to, to enforce change of variable. So is that one of the axioms, then? I mean, the character? I, mean, uh, I don't know. I, I, I may not have completely written down the list. But yeah, this something like this list is the. Including the last one. Uh, yeah, you probably want something like that, that it should, I mean, yeah, for in, in sufficiently small disks, it should agree with, with the naive. And the second to last one, I mean, what are the conditions I mean, on, on, on after this to make sense? I mean, oh, this should, be, this should be a holomorphic zero form on a wide open subset containing P and Q. I mean, it might be enough to, to impose some weaker condition, but that's certainly true. It's probably, probably you know, sort of demand general functoriality. I mean, it's sort of like if you choose, uh, I, don't know, I, th I think you probably need to assume this you know, sort of local, local uh, analytic. You know, yeah, you need some, so, yeah. yeah, you want some compatibility with the with the local, with the natural local definition. Did you just say what it means in practice? I mean, just say that F has, is defined on this Y over Y. Yeah, we'll see it in a, we'll see it in the, it, we'll see it explicitly in the hyperlogic. I mean, basically, it means that you're you're writing this thing as I mean, this you you choose some function with poles in these bad disks, and you, instead of writing kind of rational functions, you're writing down power series where the denominators get worse and worse poles, but only in in these disks, and there's some sort of piano convergence. Yeah, I think it can have a sort of limit of rational. Yeah, I mean, the Monsky Washington algebra that we're going to be using explicitly in a moment kind of has contains functions defined on on these uncertain wide opens like this. OK, so let me set up the uh, notation for the specific case of hyperelliptic curves, and then I can deliver it to, to Robert to tell you what actually happened. So now, x is going to be the hyperelliptic curve, the complete hyperelliptic curve. y squared equals, what are we calling it, a of x? We're not really sure, where a is Oh, so first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to restrict to k equals qp, because um, that's all we've done so far. Um, although a lot of this should extend relatively easily. Uh, so a is going to be a polynomial uh, over zp, which is monic of degree 2g plus 1, such that a bar of the mod p reduction has no repeated roots, 
So this defines uh, a hyperelliptic curve of degree g uh, with one rational virus stress point sitting out at infinity um, and good reduction. Okay, and so z, I'm, so I'm, I'm going I'm to do calculations uh, based on taking out certain points, and the points I want to take out are all the virus stress points. So it's the points where y equals 0 or infinity. Uh, and so here's where I'm going to explicitly make uh, holomorphic functions on wide opens. So, so the, this, the key ring that we're going to use for this calculation is this sort of monsky washnitzer weak completion of, well, let, the A is just going to be the coordinate ring of the affine x minus z. So it's, uh, so it's just global. global regular functions on there, which is just uh, qp adjoin x, y, z modulo y squared minus a of x and y, z minus 1. So this takes out the, this takes out the, the finite Weierstrass points. And the a, a, so a dagger is, so you can think of it as uh, for what's, what's a good way to think of this? Uh, so you can think of it as so x so well let me write this down first and then I'll explain what happens. Um, shoot, I need another letter here. What is what's a letter I'm using? Am I you're using B for anything? No. <laughs> I, just, I just need a letter here. Uh, So, so I'm going to take sort of formal sums like this. Let's say I take bi in QP of x of degree at most 2g, because somehow if I had a 2g plus 1, then I would uh, roll that over to another term. And, And I want some growth condition, which says that the, the p-adic valuation of the I, I of x should grow faster than some linear function of the absolute value of i as absolute value of i goes to infinity, plus or minus infinity. You can write that in symbol if you want, but that, but. To say it conceptually, so basically what you have is you have infinite series, uh, and you're allowing so you sort of allow essential singularities uh, near uh, near the Weierstrass points on the lifted curve. So they'll be in sort of some disks around in the sort of Weierstrass residue disks. Um, this condition. This condition actually forces the thing to be holomorphic, uh, not just away from the Weierstrass residue disks, but in some annuli around the Weierstrass residue disks. So this is where, so any, any such guy is in fact holomorphic on a wide open. And so we want to be able to integrate one forms sort of with coefficients in this ring. So this construction that goes from A to A dagger, it mm -hmm. seems as if it's also using somehow the model for the Yes it is. But not not just the algebra. It is. It is using the model. It is using the formal structure. That's right. So it's yeah, it's, so it's really defined on the level of uh, taking a formal scheme to its uh, weak formal completions in Meredith's construction. Sorry, what does that say? It should grow faster than some linear function? Some linear of function of absolute value of i as absolute value of i goes to plus or minus infinity. Oh, that's plus or minus, okay. Yeah, sorry. You just have to do it in both directions because, and that's because I took out not just infinity, but finite functions. And, oh, and that's an honest to god asshole, though, not the asshole. No, yeah, that's, that's infinity <laughs> at absolute value. Sorry. sorry. 
Yeah. Okay, so do you need any other notation from me at this point? I don't think so at this point. Okay, maybe I should have mentioned, or no, maybe I'll just mention it at the end. I was going to mention, we, well, we already had one application of this in the previous talk, but maybe I'll just mention one other thing that one would like to do in order to be able to compute these, by way of computing these things, is, um, is Chabot-T's method, is to sort of use these explicitly uh, to look for rational points on curves over Q. Um, well, for that, one probably wants not just this, but also the iterated version. Um, where, so there's a, there's a version of this that does, you know, what are the so-called iterated integrals. Uh, but we're not, we haven't done that, so I won't say too much about it. The iterated integral would be for higher dimensional varieties? Or? No, it would be for doing so-called non-abelian oh, Chabot-T okay. method, which was introduced by Mignon Kim, where instead of looking at uh, Instead of sort of looking at the, the abelian quotient of the fundamental group and sort of turning that into Jacobian, you take certain non-abelian unipotent quotients of the fundamental group, and you, you end up looking at uh, these things that he calls Selmer varieties, uh, and it's some sort of non abelian So going from say the abelian thing to one of the non-abelian things is sort of a non-abelian descent technique that uh, that Kim has suggested. So let's see what actually happens when we do this in try to use it. Hey. So, um, so you can do this um, explicitly in the hyperelliptic curve. Um, and so here's kind of how you uh, go about doing that. So this is kind of the same notation as before. These are the um, properties mentioned. So you have um, additivity in the points, linearity um, in the forms, this change of variables thing if you um, have a function from one curve to another and um, fundamental theorem of calculus, and then also local analyticity. And um, so you kind of use all these together to, um, to compute this, uh, this integral. So um, tiny integrals is if you want to just compute the integral within a single residue disk. And so if you have two points in the residue disk, then you just use the fact that it's locally analytic. Um, so you just choose a linear interpolation from P to Q at some parameter t. Um, so, for instance, you just let x equal t, and then um, y, you just formally take um, the square root of, um, here, lowercase a is my, I have uh, y squared equals a of x. <laughs> well, because I was happy, capital A was the, the thing the you could dagger. Yeah, sorry. The, we, we ran out of variables, because q and p and f and r and everything was taken. So. <laughs> but, um, so if you just do um, x as a linear interpolation between the two, um, and then you can take y as uh, the square root of that thing and just compute that as a formal power series. Um, and then you can integrate this thing as a formal power series to whatever um, precision in t that you want to. Um, and Wait, what is that here? What is omega? Or so omega is our form here, which is of this form. Um, okay. it's, uh, it's an element of the dagger ring. So we've got omega here is uh, sum, uh, sum of monomials of x and y, or y. How is it related? Well, it's a one form, so it's, it's times some dx. Times, yeah, dx over y. And, and that's related to f? Oh, it's just, you're just writing it as f by y. So yeah, so in, like so, in so in this case, this is, this is some function of f and y. Well, this is not just any old function. This is uh, um, an okay. element of our category times the invariant differential. Okay, even if P and Q are in the part of the wide open subset that also contains a hole. Um, so this is the, if P and Q are in U, so it's but they could still be in U and, and yeah, so sharing sharing the rest of the class with the with hole. Uh, I think we're I, we're probably assuming that they are not in their in a res in a virus class. What is class. U? What is U? Oh, uh, U is so. I mean, we didn't. I didn't say exactly what U is. U is going to be some. Yeah, maybe I should say. Yeah. So each of these, each of these is holomorphic on some wide open U containing in full each non Weierstrass residue disk. So the residues that don't correspond to Weierstrass points downstairs are, are entirely in this wide open. And the other ones, you just have an annulus. 
So for this, we probably are assuming that this is a non-virus strauss residue. Yeah, I know we're okay with this non-virus strauss We didn't actually, well, I don't think we've tried it in a virus strauss residue case. Well, I think, it's, I mean, I mean, there shouldn't be a problem. Of course, once you are in, in this, in this I don't know, you have to choose a branch of the logarithm. Yeah, so I think we haven't really, we haven't implemented doing it in the, in a non-virus Strauss residue disk. So yeah, there shouldn't be a problem if you have to choose a branch. Of the yeah. Problem. But, yeah. okay, for the rest of the talk, assume P and Q are not in a virus Strauss. Neither P nor Q within a virus Strauss residue disk. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so in that case, we could just do this locally, and um, and the uh, the important thing is that um, since P and Q are the same residue, if you compute this out, you realize that um, that this is actually a power series in P times T, and so whatever precision in T you have, that gives you the piatic precision. So um, you can compute it to any desired piatic precision um, just by formally integrating and then uh, plugging in your um, P and Q. Into your result, so so that lets us integrate between in, within one of the residue disks, and then um, so just another um, point of notation is uh, type Mueller points. Oh, um, there should be two L's there. And uh, so if uh, now we let V be our um, Q power Frobenius lift, and we actually only implemented this for P, um, and uh, then type Mueller point is a point that's invariant under this uh, this action. And in every residue disk, there is a type Mueller point. Um, there's a unique type Mueller there's point. There's a unique type Mueller point. And uh, this well, is fixed there. What? You have your two L's there. <laughs> find and replace didn't find and replace everything, I guess. Um, it's easy to see because you can just take the type Mueller um, lift of uh, the x coordinate and then find out where the corresponding y coordinate has to be to match. So, so P is, of course, what is P? Is P is a, a, P is a point. Is so you define P on algebra. Oh, um. So P acts on. This is Q power for being asleep, So it's actually linear. So you can think about it. As an upright. This is this is the Q. So you, you take that's a, not the semi-linear. That's actually the linear. Yeah, yeah. This is actually linear over over Q. Say Q P, or or. Yeah, since we're just doing this over QP. Yeah, so this is actually, I mean, this actually corresponds to a rigid analytic map between some two wide opens of this form. And again, P and Q are always not going to be in a virus stress residue disk. So whatever the wide opens are, P and Q are going to be in the domain of the, of the geometric map. So hey, dagger, it's. Uh... Like geometrically, what is a dagger supposed to look like? Like, uh, like that's a, I don't know what you mean. It's a ring. It's it's a, it's a direct limit of what it is. It's a direct limit of the rings of holomorphic functions on all wide opens of this form. Mm -hmm. There is no other place. Okay. Uh, so in some ways, it's I mean, so for, whenever you calculate, you're actually calculating with some specific growth conditions. So you actually have some specific. So um, how, how's wide that, open. How's that, like, giving the Frobenius on that range is well, giving you a P is a global point, P is some point on it, the whole curve? It, or? it actually, it acts on the curve, and then the thing is, you can, um, in this case, you can actually um, do the action, you can do the pullback of the action on the differentials. Um, this is, I mean, because it's a problem. geometric, I mean, because it's corresponding to some geometric, you can interpret that as you have some geometric map between so you can you can view phi as going from right, and so it's a map on these rings. So in particular, it acts on sub ring sub, certain sub rings which correspond to actual wide opens. So going in the other direction, you get some map between actual wide opens. Yeah, but it's not the same. So somehow you, you always start with a, with a, with a geometric map. The only problem is that somehow it sort of the, the geometric map sort of shrinks the uh, shrinks the angular. So it's not, you never get a map between one wide open, the same wide open, you have to change the wide open. And then this limiting procedure sort of, sort of takes care of that. But it's better just to think about it geometrically. Yeah, okay. and, and, and the point is P, we're always, so this residue, when you say residue class here, we always, we mean, again, non-Vier Strauss residue class. So those are all, those are in all of the wide opens. Okay. Is it type full of which you take? Yes, it depends on the choice of 
but uh, we're but yeah, we're going to use a particular choice in a moment. And, uh, but yeah, but this is but this fact is true no matter which lift you use. It's just that the particular type of point will be different depending on which lift you use. Are you supposed to work? Yeah, I was asking. Uh, I mean, phi is defined on a star, a dagger. Correct. What does phi of p mean? Uh, it means you take the ma I mean it, you take the maximal ideal uh, of a dagger of functions that vanish at the point p, uh, and you pull that back to another maximal ideal. And that's that's the point. That's the right. I mean, it's so you have. I mean, you have a sort of Nullstellensatz for rigid analytic spaces, uh, just like you do for varieties of a field. Maybe it's better just to say that you have a field which is geometric. Just forget about the, the overconvergence uh, condition. So you have a geometric map where you throw away the entire residue disk. And then uh, and that's, that's this map which is given here. And then it so happens, and, and then of course that, that leads to uh, functions, rigid analytic functions. And it just so happens that it also preserves uh, overconvergence. So if you pull back an overconvergent function, you still get an overconvergent. Yeah, when you see the algebra, the, the convergence is quite important, but yeah, that's... What do, you, what do you mean by a geometric map? It's given by such a ring map, I presume. Yes. <laughs> no, but, but I think what I'm not suggesting is first think of the ring map, which is you take the actual PI completion, which uh, is, yeah. you know, an aphanoid algebra, right? And then, and then, you know, you have a field Frobenius map from that thing to itself, and that corresponds to a geometric map on the complement of, the full complement of the, res, the, the virus stress residue. And then it just so happens that you can construct that so that it's overconvergent, which will be important for the calculation later. And if you roll the map, this will be much more complete. So yeah, well, well wait, you're, 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 that's going to be on another slide, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, here it is. So this is, this is getting down to really concrete. You can actually you know, show this to your calculus class, and they can copy it down. They wouldn't know what it means. <laughs> but, uh, so, um, so here is the, um, the uh, choice of a Frobenius action that um, we choose. So if we let phi of x go to x to the p, um, and then that fixes what um, phi of y has to go to. And, um, and the thing is, you can this thing is equal to this thing. Um, it's just expanding it out. And this thing you can see if you just expand this out via um, Newton's formula. Um, there's an extra um, p in here when you work out all the algebra that makes this thing converge nicely. Uh, so, so that's our actual choice of Frobenius. And then, um, then we have the sponsor washington circle homology that's spanned by um, basis elements of the form x to the i dx over y. And so when we apply this, um, this well, it should be a, this should be a, the pullback to this uh, this one form. This is the uh, result that we get. I should say this Monsky Washington cohomology here. It's just the co kernel of the differentiation. Differentiation. Yeah. So and it turns out that it's finite dimensional uh, with the basis. Uh, you have the basis. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'll well, it. yeah. The basis yeah. is so co kernel is yeah. It would be, and then from zero. Well, to oh, so actually, let me write this out. Yeah. Because what we're actually using here is so this is the co kernel, the co kernel of D. But what we want is there's a hyperelliptic involution in the picture, which takes y to minus y, and we're only going to be calculating in oh, yeah, we have the, we're only going to be calculating in the minus part of that um, because well that's where all the interesting stuff happens that's where all the homomorphic guys live uh, so this thing is spanned by this is spanned spanned by x to the i dx over y for i goes from zero to two g minus one so that's that's the basis of, of h one Monsky wash that's out. So, um, so the uh, the thing is, we can, we can apply this the pullback of this uh, lift of Frobenius to each one of these basis elements, and see what happens um, to understand the action. Actually, create a matrix that encodes the action, uh, 
and then we'll so when we when we expand this out and this uh, use this this form right here to compute this thing um, just formally as a big um, power series with positive and negative terms of y um, and because all the um, all the powers of y involve a power in basically this thing and this thing live in the same residue class. And so you have an extra p here. So every power of y occurs paired with a p. And so you can expand this out to uh, um, a finite number of terms of y, both in the positive and negative direction. And that gives you a finite, um, that tells you what your precision is in terms of p. And since you know that it decays, if you're looking at a fixed precision p, you only need to look at a fixed precision y. And you know you can get the whole thing. So, um, and then, you get the thing up to some precision. And then what you do is you um, reduce by subtracting off um, appropriate multiples of those things. So you're just um, working, and you use the homology relations to reduce it back in terms of the basis elements. And then you can write a matrix of this action in terms of these um, basis elements here. So and that's explaining why you can do this with just looking at finite num finite number of um, power bounded powers of y in positive and negative direction. <clears throat> so um, so the um, the key point here is uh, how do you compute integrals between things that are not in the same residue disk? And so if you have P and Q that are type Mueller points, then what you do is you um, you choose a basis and you just um, choose this basis here. Um, x to the i dx over y. And then <clears throat> you compute the pullback on each basis element. And so this is this matrix that we computed before. And then you keep track of what differentials you needed to subtract, what forms, exact forms you needed to subtract off. Um, so in the previous slide, we decomposed it as a sum of basis elements plus um, an exact form. And then what you can do is you can compute each one of these by solving a linear system and you compute all of them together. So we start out with, we have, um, we uh, use the fact that these are type Mueller points that, to get this equality. And then we use the uh, change of variables. And then we do our substitution with the calculation we got before. And this is linearity and that is um, fundamental theorem of calculus. And notice now that this is a linear system in our integrals of basis elements. So we, for each basis element, we have uh, two g minus one basis elements. We have two g minus one, uh, two g. Yeah, zero to two, zero to two g minus one. So we have two g uh, basis elements, and we have two g, um, this is a linear system of two g, um, yeah, it's 2g yeah. by 2g. It's a 2g by 2g linear system. Um, and so we can solve for the integral from p to q of the omega i. There's a, there's a key point here, which is that the matrix A, so the, the, the matrix of the linear system is A minus the identity. That has, the, none of, that has that's invertible, because the eigenvalues of A are numbers, are algebraic integers of, of absolute value q to the, or p to the 1 half. So they're not one. Uh, the other comment that's worth making is this is really just Coleman's definition, except I've written it in terms of a matrix in terms of instead of the characteristic polynomial for Banius. Coleman's definition is basically the same thing, but you instead of writing out a system of equations, you you apply the characteristic polynomial for Banius, so you just get individual equations. Yeah? So the Fs here, these are just elements like Trump, like sort of finite um, sums of those terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're truncations of elements of A. Right. I mean, the principle that really are elements of A dagger, but we're only computing. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So in some way, this this last integral, but when you're doing it in the for PQ in type Miller points, is this the right way of thinking about it, that you're doing the integration on the special fiber, or is that completely um, wrong? Sort view? of. It's I don't know. I don't know. It's a good way to visualize this. No way. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the crazy abstract way that, that people think about this is that 
uh, I mean, in, in sort of Deleen's language, that what's going on here is what, what Coleman showed is that the, the, there's a, in the Durham realization, there's a, canonic, there's a unique Frobenius invariant path. And that's what you're integrating along. So if that makes any sense to you, then think of it that way. <laughs> if it doesn't make any sense to you, then just completely ignore it. <laughs> OK, so um, this allows us to um, compute the uh, between two any, any two type Mueller points, and then we just uh, um, use linearity. Um, we have once we have it on the basis elements, we can do it on any. Uh, use, using linearity and FTC. Yeah. Because yeah. if you have a form, you have to write it as those guys, a combination of those guys, plus an exact, and use FTC. Yeah. Mm. So we put it together. We we have two points P and Q. Then we find the um, Tegmuller points P prime and Q prime that lie in the same disk. And then we just integrate like that and sum it up. So um, this allows us to integrate between any two arbitrary points. And again, if they're not virus trust. Yeah, if the they're not in the virus trust disk. Or the, yeah, same residue disk as virus trust <laughs> point. So, um, <clears throat> so this has been uh, implemented in SAGE for hyperelliptic curves. So this started a year ago, the MSRI student run to a student workshop. Um, where we implemented the bias algorithm for computing this matrix, this action of Frobenius, um, in the context of trying to compute piatic regulators and um, piatic heights, and also um, it's useful for point counting. Um, you take the characters of polynomial, this thing that tells me how many points are on the elliptic curve. This was actually just for elliptic curves, um, and <clears throat> so that um, that was done about a year ago. And then in the Arizona Winter School, um, Huron suggested this problem of doing um, Coleman integration using building on this um, this thing. So um, it was extended to hyperelliptic curves, um, and then kind of the other uh, machinery around um, to to flesh it out with Tegmuller points and the small integrals and everything um, was added. And also the thing that needed to be added was keeping track of these exact forms because in the in the reduction step, um, you need to keep track of what exact form you're subtracting off to use the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus um, to actually compute the integral. If I remember the history correctly, we did well, we were only doing elliptic curves at the moment. We were only doing elliptic curves. Because we didn't have that code for hyperelliptic curves yet. No. So, so, so after the winter school, we had to go back and first generalize that first thing to hyperelliptic curves. But then after, once we did that, it was relatively easy to extend yeah. the Coleman integration. So what stops you from implementing it for hygienous curves? Mm -hmm. Um, you mean non hyperlocate curves or? Yeah. Uh, well, you have to you have to know how to you have to have know how to do the first thing. You have to have an analog of. I mean, the basic thing is that you need. I mean, so in order to use this method, this Moscow washington cohomology method, uh, you have to have a procedure for uh, reducing forms. So you apply for you you construct a Frobenius lift on some lifted of the of your curve on, on your piatic curve, and then you have you get some crazy power series uh, of, of one forms, and you've got to turn that back into an exact form plus your basis differentials, uh -huh, and one. it's quite easy to do this for hyperelliptic curves. There are some other classes of curves for which it's not so bad to do this. Um, for instance, so-called non-degenerate curves. Um, it's, it's reasonable to do this. This is actually, I mean, there are algorithms even implemented for doing this. Um, but for a general curve, it's kind of tricky. But there are, there are much more general classes besides hyperelliptic curves for which that first thing exists and we could conceivably use it. Yeah, the CAB curves are one generalization. So the CAB curves are things like, maybe I'll just mention, so a hyperelliptic curve has this form, y squared equals p of x. The CAB curve is something like, uh, well, the way, to just, the way to draw these things is you draw the Newton polygon, or Newton poly uh, of. So these will be things of the form q of x, y equals 0, where the Newton polytope is something like, so you, you, plot, you plot a vertex in the x, y plane for each uh, non-zero coordinate. And what you want is something like, a triangle like this, where so you have some points in the interior, 
And then if you restrict, if you just sort of pick out the points on the boundary on each boundary side, uh, you want to get a polynomial with no repeated roots. So that's and and the non-degenerate condition is basically the same thing, but you allow an arbitrary polygon. And again, you require on each boundary of the polygon if you just pick out the terms there and and that view that as a homogeneous polynomial in the appropriate sense, then it's a polynomial with no repeated roots. So yeah, for those kind of curves, you have a good production procedure. So in fact, you can try to do uh, this Frobenius uh, lifting and reducing. So you can find this exact form. Yeah, so, so what you could probably do the Coleman integrals there too, but we haven't tried. Lifting and Frobenius can be more Yeah, yeah, this, I mean, just to, it's a little bit naive for me to say that it, that it just plain works. It's much. The, 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 the Frobenius lifts that you make here are much more complicated. So in practice, this is much trickier. But in principle, one could still do it. And, and in fact, there are even implementations available. You mean for the point counting? For the point counting, but for, for computing the Frobenius matrix. Yes, yeah, so that actually uh, kind of relates to um, it would be complete without mentioning that David Harvey re-implemented what we did at um, the MSI workshop um, to compute the matrix of Rubinius. Um, and it's asymptotically a lot faster, and the implementation is faster, but it doesn't actually compute the exact forms. Um, in fact, it runs in time. Um, the, the size of the exact form is O of n, and it runs in time less than that. And so there's no way it could actually give you all the information you need, um, if I understand right. Well, so far. Well, I, I just I want to make a correction. It's asymptotically faster when p is very large compared to, compared to the precision you want, but it's slower in the other direction. Like okay. Fixed p is slower in that um, in, in, the, in that precision. Um, and that, that's a, that's a really interesting question about the, whether you can um, keep track of all that information. I, I think maybe you can. I think you can. Um, I mean, because what you really need is not the whole exact differential, but it's values at the two points. True. Yeah. So I think, in principle, you could actually so we build that into your fast calculation. Yeah. So yeah, this is, I mean, yeah, Although, this is an idea that I floated by various people, like Jen. And I, 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 I don't know, did I not float this by you? I think you mentioned it, yeah. 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 It's nice to have the forms, because you can do the, then you can do this pre-computation. Um, once you have the form, then you can plug any points in. It's certainly not very, yeah, it's certainly more convenient to do it the way we have it. But in principle, if you had a particular if you're willing to do the Frobenius part every time you wanted to integrate something, then you could build, you could conceivably build everything into the Frobenius calculation mm. and have a have a fast, a faster, a fat for large P, a faster Coleman integrator. Mm -hmm. well, actually, I suspect that if you, I mean, you have these reduction matrices, and probably what you're going to come up with is going to be an augmented reduction mm -hmm. matrix. Exactly. That's, that's where all the work is going to mm -hmm. so you're exactly. going to do that once. Yeah. Oh, um, no, but you're going to, no, but the problem is that, well, you have to do it once for each, uh, I mean, it, you're, what you're going to get is going to be something specific to a, to a pair of residue disks. Oh, that's true. If you, want a third, if, you have, if you get a third residue disk into the picture, you have to do the whole thing over again. For that, I mean, or or you could batch it. You could do a bunch of residue disks at once, which would be which would be more sensible. Anyway, maybe we should move on. So yeah, that's something to look into. That's further discussion. So um, so kind of just this is quickly uh, um, some stuff about the actual implementation in Sage. Um, so we uh, we tried to convert everything over to use um, Newton iteration, which wasn't the first way it was written. Um, to take square roots and stuff like that. Um, there was a lot of special parent classes that we made. Um, special cubic quotient ring, special hyperelliptic quotient ring, um, stuff like that. <laughs> and um, it also resulted in finding a lot of really slow parts of the Sage. For instance, Laurent series were really, really slow. And now they're something like 100 times faster than they used to be. Um, which still isn't fast enough, but they're a lot faster. <laughs> and um, so here's a uh, just a summary of the code. Uh, that's how many lines of code there are, not necessarily unique lines. And a lot of that's documentation, not enough of it. Um, so, 
Here's a demo of, um, so I just took uh, the elliptic curve 11A and I'm going to take just um, piatic with 19 prime to degree to <coughs> precision 15. And so um, this point here that I'm constructing P is actually a torsion point. Um, and just to prove it, here's 5 times P. And so um, there's the invariant differential. Um, it's just 1 to whatever piatic precision we have, dx over 2y. And here's our um, Monsky wants to watch its generators. This is these uh, things that live in the dagger ring here. And so if we integrate from p to 2p, um, what we should get is we should get a 0. Because Coleman integration um, is invariant under translation. So if we go from p to 2p, 2p to 3p, 3p to 4p, and 4p back to um, the end. If you go all the way around the circle, you have to get zero. And so every piece has to be zero. I should say that translation invariance is not a defining property. It's, 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 it's a property of Coleman integration, but it's not part of the definition. It's actually a consequence of the uniqueness. No? Yeah, it's a consequence yeah. of the function. Yeah, it's a consequence of the function. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's somehow, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's forced upon you by the other properties. Uh -huh. um, so that differential, is, that, is there some new class that represents yeah. differentials in general? No, it's, it's a special monsky okay. or differential. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do want to do that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I mean, one um, issue is that this is not real. This is not a differential on an algebraic. Hmm. Well, this thing is a differential on an algebraic curve, but its image of a Fermanius is not. So it also, doesn't is that really fit in the context of talking about differentials on algebraic curves. Plus, stupid thing that should be parentheses around two y. <laughs> In your yeah, yeah, that's, that's just a printing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, so um, does anyone have a favorite um, differential that they want to integrate? <laughs> yeah, if you integrate a non-holomorphic differential, you shouldn't get zero you, I mean, between these two points. Can you integrate between non-torsion points? I can, except for this doesn't have anything in torsion points. No, I mean like on a different curve. Yeah. Um, Could you take like a rink one curve? Table down there? I don't, uh, uh, I have a hyperliptic example. So here's uh, something that's non trivial. Oh. Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> so you're not just testing it. <laughs> um, so here's a hyperelliptic curve. And on this hyperelliptic curve, we have um, P minus Q is torsion. So we integrate this. Oh, and uh, one thing to notice is that these are cached. So for instance, uh, you, did you redefine x? No, mm. it's because the uh, coercion model is. Uh, no, no, but you, you, you didn't you oh, define I didn't, X? I did add yeah, yeah. So you need true. to redefine so the X back up that way. Yep. Yeah. So it's much faster the second and third time around than, uh, than the first time around, because it caches um, the information about the um, the forms that you subtract off and the... It's, 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 it's caching the constant. Because 17 plus... Oh, 17 plus 9. Yeah, okay. So here's a hyperliptic example. Is this the one I got from a few, one of Bjorn's papers? I believe so. This is the one you sent me. So, yeah, so this is a 29 torsion point? Yeah. <laughs> and um, so that's kind of the demo portion. I don't know if uh, we wanted to do a different curve, say.
this. So now we can do calculation and then um, changing ranks. This is because um, we don't have fast linear algebra yet over the piatics and so I have to change over to the rationals to do the linear algebra mm -hmm. um, because doing it over the piatics generically is really really slow. What, what changing which rate? So um, I actually, so this um, this thing right here is, uh, these are piatic and what I do is I actually um, pretend that they're rational numbers to do the reduction, because the linear algebra over the rationals is much, much faster than linear algebra over the piatics. So is this just kernels, or? Um, it's actually it? just uh, adding vectors and multiplying vectors. Yeah, it's not even fancy. Yeah. It's just basic operation. Um, and then, even more surprisingly, so this is, um, this is all the stuff um, to compute this, um, the Frobenius, the matrix solvents. This right here is the sum of all these here. And then this right here, an equal amount of time to turn it into a rational number. And, <coughs> and to turn it into a, a power series of the rationals from a power series of mechanics. And then this right here is to reduce. And um, the reduction should not be the expensive part, but reduction goes back and forth between mm -hmm. the rationals and the integers mod p to the n. Because if you do it all over the rationals, then your the um, denominators and numerators of these rationals just get huge. Because you're never really reducing; you're working in an exact ring. And um, you can't do it in z to the um, p to the n because it involves division by p occasionally. And um, linear algebra over the piatics is really slow. So this part right here, um, once we have fast linear algebra over the piatics, should be smaller than this number here. So. And that's the uh, hold up for making these. So ideally, you'd like to have something where you can divide by p and you get you get some unspecified higher order bits. Yeah, or that. 
that will benefit. I mean, that's a, yeah. Oh, that does exist? Yeah. Yeah. Well, not for Zima. It, it, it right. exists in the fiatics. Oh, okay. It exists in the fiatics, but linear, al linear algebra with that is extremely slow. Because it's using just generic linear algebra algorithms rather than anything optimized. But can't you, can't you bound the order of P's with the Um You can, yeah. And that's what I was thinking about doing. Right. Uh, but yeah. One funny thing about these algorithms in general is that the, the loss of precision is actually much less than the number of factors of P that you divide by along the way. There's all this. Uh, unexpected cancellation that happens along the way. So if you actually do the computational model that I described, which is every time you divide by P, you put unspecified, you just, whatever the un undetermined bits are, you just fill them with zeros or garbage or whatever you want. Um, if, you, if you do that, then in fact, you get these mats of magical cancellations along the way. So you lose much less precision than the number of divisions you actually did. Yeah, you, end, you end up multiplying by P almost as often as you divide by P. It's like, log and the number of terms you keep track of, of times you actually divide by p without, you know, canceling out by multiplying, but, um, yeah. So, um, and then, uh, so this is kind of the um, future work is doing iterative colon integrals, which I don't really understand much about. I just understand that supposedly they're useful. Um, and, um, but I'd like to know more. And then uh, we only did this over QP, and you should be able to do it over uh, extensions of that. I guess we're going to start. You want to. You want to implicitly. You want to start with unramified extensions. Yeah. The QQ. There's the whole certain things. Yeah. Will, yeah. A bunch of stuff. To Not too much will, will be different in the unramified case, but a little bit. Just some precision calculations. Yeah. One of the things is this is only for um, p equals two and three, and I think actually when p not oh p not equal to two and three, because um, um, there's certain cases where we do things where the coefficients two and three pop up. I think the genus might be illegal here as well. Um, I might be wrong on that. Oh yeah, you want to be careful if p is rather small compared to the genus. Yeah, or I think p equals the genus. You might. I think it's the the thing that's always come up before that p is more than two g plus one. Then everything seems to be okay, and if it's less than that, then it's not a problem. Yeah, and certainly weird yeah. things happen when p equals 2g plus 1. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's mostly a matter of just there, there are some extra precision losses that you have to account for. Yeah. Uh, and, well, p equals 2 is kind of exceptional. But. So, it's, yeah, it's not, um, it doesn't work in these cases. Then, um, obviously, there's a lot of optimization. How much of the optimization is necessary if that we have a fast piatic linear algebra? Um, I think once we have fast piatic linear algebra, then we'll be able to actually see was there anything else here that's taking an extraordinary amount of time. But right now, it's just overwhelmingly yeah. the linear algebra. That I mean, I have the feeling we're going to. I mean, eventually, when the thing gets optimized, we're going to discover oh, it's this, it's this big monsky washington calculation. <laughs> yeah, uh, that we that's that's just plain hard. But that. We might as well pick off the low hanging fruit first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Optimizing other parts of Sage that need it. There are widespread benefits to doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, like for this Laurent series stuff, it's not just you know, Coleman integration that gets faster. It's every time anyone uses it. Mm -hmm. So. And did you want to talk about some of the applications? Well, I, yeah, I mentioned a little bit of uh, maybe. I think I said enough already. So we had the, we had the example of piatic heights earlier, and then uh, the iterated versions will be useful for iterated versions so these non-abelian versions of the Chabot method, which would involve comparing certain, sort of, yeah, basically computing a bunch of uh, these iterated Coleman integrals in hopes of trying to prove that you don't have rational points on some curve over Q in certain residue classes. So it, it would be interesting to see how that works out for the non-abelian situation. But in the abelian situation, you can actually always basically get by with only computing tiny integrals. Right, because you somehow can move yeah. things around. But in the non-abelian case, you, it's you not clear know. at all that you have some something like that. So yeah, no. I mean, so, so sort of my idea is that 
so yes, you can, in the abelian case, you can avoid doing global Coleman integrals, but if you understand how to, yeah, how to yeah. do everything in terms of Coleman integrals, that will give you yes, yeah. the framework to go to the non-abelian yeah. case. So it would be good to actually understand sort of current work on, on, on Chabot's G's method in terms of the global, yeah. Coleman, yeah. Coleman, global Coleman iteration and then yeah. attempt to push towards this non-abelian mm -hmm. stuff that we're all still trying to understand. Yeah. Several of us went to a conference at Banff in February where Mignon Kim tried to explain this to all of us. So progress was made, but we still have a lot to understand about that. I, I guess by now we've entered the question phase? I think so. Yes. We're certainly time-wise we're in the question yes. phase. Any question? Correct. Uh, let me ask, uh, you, could, uh, you could also do this algorithm in a slightly different way where you don't need to assume that you start with Dash reports. Mm -hmm. um, did you try to do the to do that or compare the timing? Uh? You mean I'm not following what where I, I, I know which I, yeah I think I know which so go back to the slide where you write down the linear system. Uh, right. Uh, there. Yeah. So instead of so you're suggesting well Oh, here, instead of P and Q on both sides, you have P and Q and the Frobenius image of P and Q. Oh, right. And then you just correct one side by doing the tiny integrals and throwing exactly. that into the constants. Oh, yeah. We certainly discussed that. Um, did we ever try implementing it? I don't think so. I would. Sounds like a better way. Find it. Find integral points is quite cheap. Yeah, it's not, and I don't it's not think a problem. I don't know that you'd say because you, you still have to find the tiny, tiny integral points to do the tiny integral anyway. No, no, no. You just have to do the tiny integral between like P and the Frobenius image of P. Yeah. Oh, okay. You don't have to solve the tiny integral. But, tiny, but finding the tiny integral points is quite easy. Yeah. There are many cases where the tiny integral points are not even over your bound. No, no. They're always defined over. If, they're always defined over the same field. There, won't there be some issues of caching if you do it that way? Mm -hmm. Like, is, wouldn't it be harder to cache the mm -hmm. sort of these, this step if you do it that way? Like this, the way you do it yeah. like this is that after you solve it for one case, then um, the tiny, well, after that, the global integrals are fairly quick to solve for anything in these two register fields. But if you do it no, the other way, you can't cache it. No, I mean, if you, no, you, you only need to know, know way. you only need to know the integral between two points. At the, at the I guess yeah, you it doesn't, they don't have to be touched. Yeah, that's true. They don't have to be touched. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, I mean, the the reason I brought this up, I, I don't know if it's sort of a computational issue, but the the thing was, you no, know, well, there was a, I mean, there was another implementation not of the general thing, and I guess Nils know, knows that because me and Rob Dieu worked on impl implementing periodic polyloids, which mm -hmm. is the. I mean, it's, it's an iterated, but it's a very special iterated case. And there, there was, I mean, there, there was this, this issue where you actually wanted to, to get precise estimates on, on, on the precisions that you sort of start out by having a point which is only approximated because you sort of, you, you take the, the integral between Teichmuller points, and of course you only get an approximation for the Teichmuller points. So I think in terms of actually deciding what the precision or, Precision is for for doing this, or so proving that you get something at a given precision. That that was a big headache. Somehow, if you if you do it the other way, that you know at least you start with a point which is sort of precise. Right? You have a precise point of your curve, and just sort of compute the integral between these two precise points. And then somehow, I, mean, I thought that this at least that would be easier. I don't know if it's easier computation. Yeah. Yeah, I think in the case of good reduction, the precisions kind of don't. I mean, precision pretty uh, predictably. So yeah, well, you see, that was an iter iterated case of so the sort of imprecision yeah. sort of. But also, you're, yeah, you're doing if you're doing a polylog, like, you're probably you're presumably in a sort of a bad. I mean, you're you're. So this is a, I mean, this is a, this is like basically on P one, right? Right. Uh, your pole. Yeah. So for this calculation, it's. I don't know if it makes a difference, but it, it, it would pro we could probably do it that way too. Yeah, I guess if computing the tangular points was expensive at all, then uh, then you could just throw these tiny integrals into your constant term here. 
Yeah, that would work. Yeah, but it's extremely, I mean, type, computing types more than points. <laughs> So the application to rational points on heterogeneous curves, um, so what are the P's we are looking at uh, in that application? So, I remember how this works. So in the abelian Chabot method, you would be taking, uh, like say you have a genus one, say you have a genus two curve, so it's Jacobian as two dimensional, so, so, so Jacobian if you see is, is two dimensional, and then the curve is sort of a one-dimensional thing sitting inside here. Um, then the point is that the then there's sort of a you want the rank you want to assume that rank of J of Q is one, and so somehow geometrically what's happening is if you take the the sort of p-adic completion of this, this is some one-dimensional subvariety of this two-dimensional space, and so it intersects this other one-dimensional variety, the curve, the finitely many points. So what, ha what happens when you try to do that calculationally is you think of this in terms of, uh, you sort of want to view this in terms of doing uh, Coleman intervals. You have, there's, some, there's this two-dimensional space of holomorphic differentials, and there's some one-dimensional subspace of that which vanishes on J of Q, right? Because you can integrate between, I mean, you can, we've been talking about integrating between points, but you can integrate over, over any zero cycle. So, so you, there's, a, there's some, there's some one-dimensional subspace of the, of the space of, of holomorphic forms uh, on which uh, the interval vanishes when you do it on J of Q. And what you want to do is find all of the points on the curve where integration from some fixed base point to that other point uh, vanishes. And that gives you some, and there's some finite number of them and Coleman Sort of can tell you how many of them there are. And that, that by itself gives you a bound on how many rational points there are. And it gives you some information about which residue classes they can sit in, and so on. So that's, uh, that's sort of the generic uh, state of affairs. And of course, if to actually find rational points in general, you have to do more work. But typically, you would get, if you, you'd be lucky if you actually had one rational point in every disk where you were supposed to have one. Um, but so what you can get rid of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I am more diverse, you should be able to. Yeah, yeah. So, so there. Are, yeah. So this is where this is where it gets more intricate, where you do other things to try to, to get around that restriction. Um, but that's that's the generic. That's the generic setup, and the non-abelian thing would be something like this, where instead of the Jacobian, you would have some sort of non-abelian uh, analog of the Jacobian, uh, and you would be. But again, it would be a matter of trying to show that certain finding the points on the curve where some sort of uh, iterated Coleman integrals vanish. But that's that's still a speculative application so far. No one's actually physically done that yet. Okay. I think that makes sense. Yeah. So that ends the morning, folks. When do you want to start?